Infrastructure has typically been seen as an Achilles heel for development in Africa. How do you see infrastructure being developed and delivered differently to meet this growth potential in Africa? I think there's been a real shift in the last five years, and it really comes from governments saw all these projects, and you had the World Bank and the African Development Bank and IFC outlining these are the projects you need to do, these are what's going to unlock the economic growth. And a lot of these projects weren't moving forward. Um, and so the, the governments realized that they do need to take the lead. And we're seeing this in parts of it. East Africa is some great examples of the leadership saying, we, we are going to drive these projects. We are going to find the companies to work with. And we are going to work on finding the financing plan to actually unlock this project and move it forward versus, hey, we have some projects. Why don't you come invest in our country? Yeah. So I want to ask you about sustainable infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure. By design, it has very long lead times from design to delivery, mm -hmm. yet there's so many shifting variables in between from climate change patterns to population growth and urbanization trends. So it's almost you have to build for the future well beyond that, despite mm -hmm. all the shifts in between. What is the, how does one go about planning for that type of future? I think when, the, when governments look at projects, they, they should be looking at the whole life value of that. Um, a lot of the time, governments are looking for that quick solution of how to get this road built, how to get this rail built for today, and then they start, it starts breaking down and they actually have to continue to maintain that. And the costs associated with the operations of that become so significant that the actual cost of the project has, has become unrealistic, it's not sustainable in that point of view. So governments are looking, as they're looking at the larger projects, they're looking at what are the sustainable solutions for long-term quality of those products, and as well as how do you build the capacity of those the companies within the countries, such as the local contractors, the suppliers, um, working with the in universities and the training programs to build the capacity for those companies then to be able to build future projects in those countries. You need to have that all planned in at the very beginning. And if you only start planning that after the contract signing, those are typically where you see projects getting into trouble because they didn't anticipate what it takes to engage with that community or the requirements that were, were, were needed to build to that quality or to, to meet those environmental um, standards. Question about local content. Mm. It's, a, it's a very attractive, some would say low-hanging fruit policy to spur industrial growth and create jobs, mm. but it can create certain backlogs and timetables and delivery capacities for international contractors such as Bechtel. Mm. What are some missteps that you th have seen governments take with regards to the local content policies and how can they better execute them going forward? I mean, absolutely local content policies are criti critical to the success of the project. Um, so they have to look at what are the skill sets required at the peak and, and where, where can they work with private companies that have the experience of delivering these type of projects, setting up the right type of capacity building um, workshops and training centers to actually deliver these local content policies. So I think as governments look at that, they should be looking at flexible programs um, and, and looking at different markets. What works for manufacturing for long term versus a large infrastructure is very different versus a small construction project.